The St. John's International Women's Film Festival is based in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador. We respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has been lost forever and can never be recovered. We also acknowledge the island of Uktamguk, Newfoundland, as the unceded, traditional territory of the Beothic and Enigma. We acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Innu of Natasinan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatsuavut. We recognize all First Peoples who were here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First People have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Thank you everybody for joining us here at the Industry Forum for the St. John's Women's International Film Festival. Welcome to everybody who regularly attends and it's nice to see those of you who are joining us for the first time. Today I have the pleasure of chatting with Jasmine Motsufari. She's a Toronto-based filmmaker who works in film, obviously, and also television, a writer, director. Her debut feature film, Firecrackers, uh, was a sublime film that made quite a splash on the film festival circuit. It won a Canadian Screen Award. It uh, was featured at TIFF, the Stockholm International Film Festival. And she was described, which I wholeheartedly agree with, as a vital new voice in Canadian cinema. She's gone on to work with uh, the CBC and also Netflix, and we're going to get into some of those projects here uh, today. So welcome, Jasmine. It's nice to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Yes, yeah, so well, welcome back, actually, because when Firecrackers debuted, um, it was here at the Women's Film Festival, and we spoke mm -hmm. to you first then. Um, mm -hmm. So I was thinking maybe we could actually just backtrack a little bit and just pick up from the root in that tree and just talk a little bit about um, you know, uh, how your life changed really af after Firecrackers, because it really did make mm -hmm. such a splash uh, when it came out for, for obvious reasons. I mean, we're talking about a really, really good, uh, you know, honest film. Mm -hmm. How, with all the success- Started covering it. And so I think when you have a feature film that is Canadian, it's hard to break through all the feature films that have come out internationally. Uh, I think Firecrackers was able to breach that a little bit. And for me, it got me representation as a filmmaker, you know, agents, managers, both in the US and Canada, and um, started opening the doors for me a little bit in terms of opportunities for paid directing work, um, but also, you know, opportunities to direct other people's scripts, which came to me a lot, you know, after Firecrackers, I think I read, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of feature film scripts. Um, a lot of them, you know, uh, um, for me actually didn't resonate with me, so I didn't take any of them on. But I think that's sort of what comes to you after is, you know, when you get agents, they'll, they'll start sending you material for you to direct to sort of keep that momentum of your um, sort of that, like, you're hot right now, here, let's keep the momentum going. However, for me, it was interesting because, you know, nothing, uh, I think with Firecrackers, it's a story about two um, young women going through quite a hard time and difficult circumstance. But the, and the films that I was getting were very much about, they were female focused, but they didn't really um, resonate with what I was trying to do with my career or what I was trying to say as a filmmaker or as a person next. So, I, I, you know, at that time I started writing a second feature in 2019. I didn't have a second feature ready. Firecrackers, when you make a, a first indie feature, it takes everything out of you. You know, you're doing everything. You're working like two, at least two full-time jobs, you know, just trying to make it. So I didn't have time or the mental capacity to write anything else. However, in 2019, a lot of new ideas started coming to me. And so I started writing and I went through the TIFF writer's lab writer studio 
um, with some other filmmakers like Corey Bowles. And we, you know, exchanged scripts and gave each other notes. And that was a week long program and it was wonderful. And then right at, on the Friday of that is when the world shut down for the pandemic. So, you know, the momentum that I felt creatively at that time just came to a stop. Um, I didn't feel creatively um, inspired during the pandemic you know, like some other people did. I was very, I, I felt just blocked creatively. Um, and I reflected on the scripts that I was writing and I kind of stopped writing them and then visited them later in 2021 to start rewriting them. So There's quite a bit of delay in terms of my like creative process. Also during that time, I was very keen on getting onto TV shows tele to become a television director in conjunction with being, um, you know, a feature film writer and director. So in 2019, I started directing television, uh, mostly children's, at the time it was children's television. And then one other show called uh, The Detectives that was filmed in Quebec, just because a producer in Quebec was very, was champion, it was a, was a champion of mine, just randomly. And I got flown out there to Montreal to shoot that. But it's interesting in Canada, I find that the producers will watch a film like Firecrackers and still be like, oh, she's not ready to direct anything. And I find a lot of women and especially BIPOC uh, filmmakers tend to be, you know, funneled through the kids TV uh, route before they get to anything that's even close to what they want to direct. Not that kids TV is bad. I think actually I had wonderful experiences directing Holly Hobby and Off Squad but it all obviously is very, very far removed from anything that I've, I've done. So it's been a journey, um, I would say a few years <clears throat> to get my career to be a sustainable one in terms of financially or um, one that I like to sort of balance between writing and directing my own stuff and then also working for other people. So that's kind of how my life changed, but I would say it was never overnight. It was, I would say over the course of, about two to three years after Firecrackers was released that my life is sort of where it is right now. Yeah, and I think you make like <clears throat> an incredible point too in terms of selecting things that you're passionate about because they do take so much out of you. So if you were to take on a project that, like you said, didn't resonate with you or something like that, I can imagine it would feel, I mean, I think as we make films, no matter how much we love a project, there is a certain amount of grind, quote unquote grind, that can go with it. But you have to really love the project, I think, to be able to navigate through that grind and still feel very, you know, fulfilled. So I'm not surprised that you would say that at the core of your projects, you always have to feel like you identify with it or else sort of like, why yeah. would you take it on? especially for a feature film, you know, like, and your second feature film, I always think of it like your sophomore album as an artist, you know, it's, yeah. um, um, I think it's very important to be selective about what that is, you know, and there was a lot of, there were some big projects that came to me in terms of budget and who is making them. But um, I was, I was like, this is, this is going to define who I am. You know, like I look at, I, I look at auteur filmmakers like, somebody like Denis Villeneuve who does TV and, and John Mark Valley, rest in peace, like who did TV, but also had their voice in feature film. And that's sort of, the, those are the careers I like to, em would love to emulate in the sense that they have um, a thing, you know, it's there, they're sort of those auteur filmmakers who can go between mediums, but you have to be, you know, before they jumped to TV and made their own TV, they had a bunch of features that they did. So, yeah. yeah, you're that's what you're you're absolutely right. You have to I think you have to be careful about what you pick. And um, when you look back at firecrackers, like I, I find with the industry forum too, we you know, a lot of people tune in, but certainly some of those um, emerging filmmakers will definitely be watching uh, when this airs. And when you look back on firecrackers, like what what is or what are even if it's just a couple of big takeaways that you took from that project that would kind of you know, yes, they have to resonate with you. But when you reflect back on it, like, what are the big things you took away that now you've, from that project that helped you to succeed now? Mm. I think the biggest thing is um, making a feature that was not connected to many financiers or people who could 
um, sort of put their opinion in it in a development stage. We made the film through the Telefilm Talent to Watch program, um, which was actually at the time called the Telefilm Micro Budget Program, I believe. So at the time and still is to this day, a fund that supports first features and it has to be yours. It has to just be yours and maybe a producer's film, but not there's nobody else who can own the film legally, which I think is a brilliant thing on Telefilm's part because although it limits your financing a little bit, it means that the film is truly yours and nobody else can help shape the creative direction of it. And I think that for your for first feature, that's very important. It should only be your voice, you know, or if you're, you have collaborators, but like, it shouldn't be a producer's voice. It shouldn't be a studio's voice telling you what that project is. Yeah. Um, and I think with Firecrackers, it was unabashedly me. And um, I, even when I was writing it, like nobody else could sort of come in and say, you know, the film should be like this or like this. It was just mine, you know, other than my peers giving sort of feedback. Um, and I think that's really important for if you're doing a first feature, make sure it's don't give away too many pieces of it to too many people. You, you know, make it keep it yours because it's, it's very rare that you'll ever get that um, opportunity again if you want to make films with a bigger budget you know then you're going to have notes kind of like you know if it's if it's with a production company you're going to have people reading the script and being like I don't know if this character should do this and their arc is this and they can get muddy you know so I think that's one of the things that led to the success was I it was only my own you know and yeah. I protected that fiercely um, I think the other thing was like finding really good people to make your film with, like just people that you love, you know, and don't settle, you know, find the people that resonate with your vision and your values. Like, even if you need to look for a little bit longer, um, uh, make sure that that team you're surrounding yourself with is there's all love there, you know, that you're all sort of aligned in your creative vision and that the space on set is safe and collaborative. And um, because, you know, directing TV since I've been in some spaces that are not like that. And, and wow, it makes me really think about how myself and um, Caitlin Grabham and Christy Neville, the producers really cultivated a space of um, love on set. You know, it was one of the best experiences of my life just making the film. And I'm like that to me, that's what making films is about is actually the making of it more or less, you know, not so much like the accolades and afterwards, it's really about the creation part. So if you can surround yourself with people who you align with, that's in extremely important. Um, and, and that goes right to the post-production too. You have to sit with your editor for months. So make sure that you, you really align with them. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's sort of, I think, and I also would just say, leave no stone unturned. You know, if you're not satisfied with a take or you're not satisfied with like the location, you just really have to put everything into it. Um, you really have to sort of understand that there is a big sacrifice in making your first feature. It's a lot of, it will take a lot out of you. But if you're really serious about being a filmmaker and you really want this to be your job, I just say, you know, don't settle. Really, really try to make it the best thing you ever could make you don't want to like look back and being like oh I should have I wish that I didn't you know do that or you know with firecrackers there's stuff that I'm not proud of in the film or I wish I could have done better but I know that we tried everything we could you know we put everything into it so I think those are the three things that I would say uh, yeah. I would I would give as advice that makes sense I mean Filmmaking definitely is, is teamwork. Somebody has to drive it, somebody has to have the vision. And, and I like that note, you know, you have to believe in it and keep your head down and, and make it. And with the micro budget, as you say, um, there is that path to really fly towards what you see as like, you want to be the end product. Um, yeah. But it's very interesting. It, it was really fun actually going through, because I'd seen firecrackers before, but uh, last night I went through a few things as well, just to prepare for today. And I did watch um, the clip of you accepting your Canadian Screen Award for Best <laughs> Achievement in Direction. Yeah. And, um, but think about it, you know, uh, and I don't want to gloss it over because, like, it is a micro-budget film. And then 
Sometime later, you're on stage accepting an award for best direction. I agree, very talented people. Um, so what was it like? I mean, I remember seeing your face, but I, <laughs> the end, I would like you for just a second Shocked. to talk about, yeah, what was it like when you heard, you know, your name calls and you're up there in front of a sea of peers? I really didn't expect it. I know that's like such a cliche thing to say, but when I tell you I didn't ever, because I was the only, I think I was the only English Canadian filmmaker as well in that category. I think the rep, uh, everybody else was French Canadian and obviously French Canadian cinema is like internationally renowned. It's amazing. And I also think, you know, yeah, I just didn't expect to be the one out of that group who was picked. Um, and I was going through like, it was such a weird time in my life because I just like gone through a very uh, extreme breakup of, like with my long-term partner, like really, really like earlier that month. And like my life was kind of like in shambles. I didn't have a place to live. <laughs> I went to, I had been in LA for like a, a screening of firecrackers, like just um, I think the week prior. And I went to get a ponytail extension, which I was wearing on that day. And it was like from here to here of like human Loved hair. It. And <laughs> I just remember walking up there and being like, this ponytail better not fall out. I better not <laughs> trip. And I had somebody help with the, with the, with my outfit too. And the heels I was wearing were very uncomfortable. And I was just like, this is, I didn't think this was going to happen. It was just, it was such a swirl. I just bring that up because I just think people need to know from the outside, it might look like, wow, everything is amazing for her. But really, it was a very actually pretty hard time in my life. That specific month was really hard. So to have that, like, to sit there and have that happen was like an out-of-body experience. And um, I love that clip in a way because I can see all, like, the producers and my best friends in the audience just, like, crying. And we'll always have that. We'll always have that documented. Yeah. And I guess I just also think it was... Um, yeah, I don't think a lot of women, and I said that in my speech, I think not a lot of women have ever won that award, hmm. not to mention any Ar Iranian women. So I was like, <laughs> yes. Um, so that was, that was, it was just revolutionary. I mean, I, I don't think that it like did a, a huge change to my career in Canada per se, but it was an amazing moment nonetheless. And I'm very appreciative to have won that. Cause that's the, also the last time that that was the in-person Canadian Screen Awards so yeah. it was kind of kind of crazy yeah and I think it's important to to see that you know even me watching that last night it just is I'm not sure your intention to be up there is like I am a leader now but certainly when somebody sees you up there accepting that award it it seems possible right and yeah other people can follow in those footsteps and, and aim for that kind of thing and it's important to see women acknowledged um in that way, especially when, yeah. you know, they're outputting that caliber of, of filmmaking, right? Um, and as you said earlier, we don't do it, make films for awards, but when they come, obviously there's, there's gratitude and everything, you know, for them. Yeah. Um, so then moving into television, uh, you, you referenced that before as well. And, you know, some women sometimes make four or five, six, features before they even get a shot at working in TV. Like there's this mm -hmm. crazy invisible barrier that seems very difficult to, to cross over yeah. and be quite frustrating. Um, yeah. And is that why you think, uh, I just want to cycle back to where you said, um, like directing some of these youth shows, is that common for women to like start there? And, and why is that? Do you think? You know, it's, it, there, it, it comes back to, you're absolutely right. It's amazing how much women can do and achieve like in a feature film space and making a feature film is incredibly difficult. But then producers who do television will treat us as if we've never made anything before and that we need to like have these baby steps taken before we can ever be trusted. But I, I really notice men do not have to go through that same process. It's very clear who they pick and especially um, BIPOC women because the people who were like my peers uh, going through some of these shows, like all of them 
were BIPOC or or just women in general, but especially that. And I was like, this is really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I when I had my agents, you know, that's that was sort of all that was coming to me were, were these kid shows. And I said to them, I just I don't understand. Have they seen firecrackers? This is so worlds apart, you know, worlds apart. And even when I was in interviews with the producers, like everybody's like, do you think you're ready to direct television? I'm like, I don't know if you understand how hard it is to make a feature film. It's, you know, incredibly hard. And I was even talking to <clears throat> Stephen Dunn, yeah. who's from, uh, yeah. who's done really well, you know, with his feature and then also going into television has his own show now, you know, Queer as Folk. And he was saying, I just, I don't understand why you're directing these shows. <laughs> He's like, I don't get it. Like, and um, again, I'm so grateful to those producers, those children's producers, because they're the only ones that gave me a chance at the, you know, in terms of television. I think even beyond that, when I do step onto set, what I've noticed, even as, as, as recent as like last month, is that there's this inherent trust showrunners and producers and even the crew who are usually mostly men give to male directors that I am not afforded. And it's just, they're, they don't trust me off the bat. They don't, it's like, I have to constantly be proving that I can do it. And I've almost, I almost feel that when women step into television spaces, we cannot be our true selves. We have to take up space almost in a way that men have traditionally done um, in order to even gain a little bit of respect or even just be listened to on set. To me, I find television, it's, it's, I've had such good experiences and also terrible experiences. It's a, it's a mixed bag. I think fakes that I did for Netflix was an absolutely wonderful experience because there was that trust given to me as the pilot director um, with the showrunner, David Turco, uh, who was also very new to film production in general, was, was coming from a writing background. And when there's trust there, as there should be, uh, it's a beautiful experience. But when there's not, which often there isn't, um, it's it's just it's a psychological and emotional um, uh, ride <laughs> to be yeah. a, a female yeah. director on a television set. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And I'm going to talk about fakes uh, here in a second. I've been watching it also, and it's been a lot of fun. Um, but just to go back to about the the mentorship what do you um i think i saw somewhere too that you did a director like a, a shadowing uh, opportunity on set maybe on one of the teams i've done shows. a few i've done yeah. a few that's and, another thing that happens yeah can you talk a little bit about about that and why like i find those things are double-edged sword it's like it's great to be doing them but also it's like why do you have to do them can't you just direct the shows but at the same time yeah. the shadowing you know can be an interesting portal into to the world so do you want to yes walk us through some of that experiences and what you think about that whole yeah process? you know I shadowed seven different television directors before you know as I was trying to get into tv some of them some of those experiences were good in the sense that this is the way I believe shadowing should happen I believe you should shadow a director and be and get an episode on that show okay. Me too. In the same in the same season, like in the same season, I think you should be shadowing the first block, and then by the end of the block, or you know, in the later blocks, you you direct an episode. That's what I believe, and I got that on two shows. One of those was The Detectives, um, with an incredible um, um, a Quebecois producer who gave me a chance, and the other one was Holly Hobby, which is um, Aircraft Pictures, and. Um, uh, the other experiences, though, we were shadowing, you know, shadowing for free, you know, you show up, you're there all day, you can't work uh, on anything else because television hours are insane. And, uh, you know, no honorarium, no, you know, none of that, just sitting and, and watching. And <clears throat> I think that shadowing TV is you need to do it. I absolutely, especially the prep process more than being on set. The prep process is like that was more that's everything in television. You know, it's, 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 it's prep mostly. And like, if you've directed um, movies before, you will find your footing on set. I think it's the prep stuff that you really should be shadowing. But 
I found it useful sometimes. And then also other times it was just to say, you know, I've been on set and I shadowed this HBO show. I, I shadowed on run, which was an HBO show, um, which was cool. And every, everybody, every director that I shadowed was wonderful, but I think the best way to learn is to actually just do it. And I think that, um, the thing with kids TV is a lot of people think of it as the low, like a low risk. And it, it is a good boot camp to learn how to do TV because TV is like the first time a lot of people work with two cameras at once, um, which is interesting. It's like the way you manage your shot list and how to make your days is different than a little bit different than feature films. So I found it positive. I just don't think that, I don't think we should be asking anybody to shadow without compensation. Um, or like, you know, an opportunity to direct on that show is my, that's my view. Um, and now, now I, I like on Robin Hood, which I just did, um, I made sure that I had a director observer because um, I hope I can always have female BIPOC um, queer trans observers because I want these people to be able to be the new yeah. um, directors of tomorrow on, on TV. Yeah, I agree with you because, you know, if somebody is shadowing also, they are not free to work on other exactly. things as well, right? Um, yeah. And it's their own investment of their time. And if they're there, they already obviously have experience. So I think it makes sense. Um, and I think it's valuable, I agree. It's, it's valuable to, to definitely do it. And it's really great to hear that you're folding that into your process because you've learned from your own journey um, probably the right way to do it and just how yes. critical it is to so some of the TV shows too. They often, you know, if they're in season four or five, they really work like clockwork. So the prep mm -hmm. is, yeah, that seems to make sense to me too. Um, yeah. And then how did um, fakes uh, come into being? Like how, how, how did fakes all come together? Well, like, again, it was at an interesting time in my career where I felt a little bit stagnant and lost. Like I was, um, it was in 2021 in the summer. I was just like lost. I felt a little bit stuck in my career. And um, my current manager now, Taj Critchlow, who uh, owns Fella, uh, the, co the production company with Director X, and he also manages Karina Evan. Um, I'd known him for a while but he wasn't my manager yet. And he called me and he's like, what's going on with your career? He's like, what's happening here? He's like, I feel like people didn't do what they needed to do for you. And uh, you know, let's help, let's help you get to where you want to be and do things. Cause it was, you know, I wasn't, not a lot of stuff was happening at that time. And then um, I got sent the script from my uh, agents in Toronto Vanguard and I read it and I, was like I have to do this I have to and I knew it was for the pilot as well and I was I was just blown away by David Turco and Tabby allows writing I thought it was actually you know a laugh out loud as I was reading it I was thought it was hilarious I thought the the, the dual perspective was really interesting and I could see the style of it I knew what the style should be as I was reading it and then Taj who's now my manager said okay, Jasmine, we're going to get you. We got to get you this. And I was like, I need to do the show. The show is made for me. I need to do it. And um, so I, with Taj suggested, I make like a, a deck, like a pitch deck. Like there's just visuals, which I'd done before for commercials. And I did for firecrackers as well. Um, and I went on the Zoom link the interview and I just said, I have this pitch deck. And there, and David was like, Hey, let's, Let's see it. So for an hour, I walked them through what I thought the pilot should look like, what I thought the show should look like, sound like, feel like. And then um, I got the job. And then like a week later, I flew out to Vancouver for two months and we shot it. So that's that's how, and I would recommend if anybody's up for like a pilot or anything or like make, make some visual deck and like, you know, walk people through it because I think that was the game changing moment. For, for the producers in hiring me. And you had someone obviously who believed in you. Yeah. Believe that you could do it. When you got that phone call, right? That was, you know, something yeah. that, that really changed your life. When someone says, hey, I don't, if, I, if they don't see your career 
for someone's not doing for you what possibly could be done for you to sort of get that phone call and kind of turn it all yeah. around. It's just like, and that's all we want. Just have belief, you know, as women that we, we can do it. It's not that, it's not that hard to, to believe, you know, when the evidence is, is there. Um, yeah, I found it interesting, you know, too, it's, um, when you look at, um, firecrackers, you have Lou and Chantel and then, um, in fakes, you have Zoe and Becca and, what is it about those partnerships uh, between women? It's like their own, their own individuals, but they do kind mm -hmm. of have dependence on each other too. So what is it yeah. about those relationships that, that have interested you and made you want to do those kinds of projects? Yeah, I think it's just sort of, I mean, with Firecrackers, because I wrote it, it was very much a focus for me of the way to explore um, some parts of female friendship, I think, I think what fakes does better than firecrackers is actually give equal time to both people. And I think that firecrackers should have done that, but I didn't do that. And that's something that I regret. I feel like um, Chantel should have had equal screen time, but that's what I liked about fakes was I was like, okay, Zoe and Becca equal, it's their stories equally, you know, they each have their own viewpoint and, um, Especially with uh, Becca, what I really loved was her her story with her family, you know, who are Chinese immigrants and how that actually affects who she is and how she runs this like fake ID business. And it's um, that's, you know, very much Tabia Lau, who's a Chinese Canadian uh, playwright, screenwriter, bringing her own experience into the show. And I thought that was wonderful. And um, so I don't know, like, I think that there was a familiarity with telling stories about female friendship and that's what made me confident in doing this. And I think it was, I think that with each um, director that came in who were all female, uh, Mars and Joyce were the, also the other directors is that we could really speak to the way we saw certain female friendship things on screen because David obviously is writing st still a little bit from an outsider point of view. You know, he's, he hasn't had the female friendship in the same way that I have or Joyce Wong has had, right? So we, I think that we, um, uh, myself and the, the actors, Jen Tong and Amelia Baranak, like we could all in the early days discuss about like the nuances of female friendship, but at the same time, we don't have to discuss it that much at all. Cause it just is so inherent to our yeah. our upbringing and um and the way we live our lives so I don't, I don't know like this project wasn't my own so I was drawn to the female friendship thing but I don't think myself personally I'm going to keep writing films about female friendship per se but I think there was a, fam a familiarity from firecrackers and also like you know me saying in the in the interview look I just did a film about female friendship I know this, you know, I know the, I love the complication of it. I love the tension that's created in it. And then, and in fakes, it's even more because the stakes are high because these two are doing an illegal operation together. So, you know, and I didn't get to sort of direct those, those episodes. Those were more Joyce's episodes where the tension between them really comes to a head and explodes. Um, but um yeah, I, I think I think it was well written. I think it was elegantly written into the story. Yeah, yeah. And of course, fakes, just for anybody who, who hasn't seen it yet. Uh, how would you describe like in one line for people out there who haven't seen it, what it actually is? Um, it's about two uh, high school friends, Zoe and Rebecca, who get wrapped up into a fake ID business and they end up creating and running the largest fake ID operation in North America. And it starts to sort of complicate their friendship and they start to go down sort of a rabbit hole of, of crime and, and shenanigans um, that lead them into almost an underworld, a criminal underworld, which we, we don't get to see fully in season one, but we, touch, we start to get in that direction. Yeah, um, it all starts out so innocent. <laughs> yes. Oh, they're very innocent at the beginning, especially yeah. Zoe. Yeah, very simple and innocent, but boy, does it take concern. Uh, yeah. Which, yeah, it's very, and it looks quite stunning as well. Um, and Phil Lennon, I guess, shot most of the, yeah. or did you shoot all of them or? All of it. Yeah, you shot all of it. 
yeah, he's worked here in Newfoundland as well on Frontier mm -hmm. and COD. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he's no stranger to here. Um, so we're getting sort of short on time. So just a, a last, maybe a couple of quick questions. How would you think, um, I know a lot of people think about Netflix, you know, as like this holy grail of uh, something to do, right? Because your storytelling reaches a global audience and of course there's a bigger budget. But um, I think with that also comes a lot of responsibilities as well. Like what are the, what are the big things about that and the challenges, even though you have a bigger budget, that's much different than, you know, working on a feature film just for anybody out there who's kind of like yeah. aspirations is, is to work on something like that. I actually found working with Netflix to be amazing, it, it, way, way more freeing than any like traditional network, to be honest, because they gave David Turco, myself, incredible creative freedom. And even Jax Media, like the an, another partner in this was Jax Media, who has done Russian Doll, Emily in Paris, um, Broad City. You know, we had very good, execs on this but I think the Netflix Netflix in general just gave us creative freedom like there was no like uh, there was no feeling of like oh you know we don't like that is this like, where I've seen on the other side because the other stuff I've done is more network television wow it's just like the notes and the and the um sort of the hand in the pot all the time so I would say working with Netflix has actually been my best, like sort of television experience because the, the freedom that they gave us was amazing. Even through the editorial, like my director's cut, and this rarely happens, my director's cut is almost exactly what you see um, for the first four episodes of Fakes. David didn't change it too much and Netflix didn't change it too much. And that's rare. And that's very rare, you know, like, um, and I don't know if people know that, like if they're getting into television, you deliver, you have a few days to deliver your director's cut of an episode, then usually it goes to the showrunner, but then on a network television show, it'll go through many rounds of notes with a network and will be, you know, shifted and changed depend, you know, to different varying degrees. But with Netflix, I feel like they were like, we love what you did, great. So I don't know, I, my experience is very positive. I would definitely do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No doubt. <laughs> that's great i'm really happy to to hear that for sure and uh i guess for my last question just to wrap it up um can you talk a little bit about what you're working on right now i know you were working on robin hood robin with the y mm -hmm. this past yep. uh summer so why don't we just conclude with uh, maybe uh, just a little bit about that and anything you're working sure. on for the for the future yeah, I just wrapped Robin Hood, um, the series created by Director X and Chris Roberts. Um, it's a, a modern retelling of the story of Robin Hood with um, a woman in the lead, a black woman in the lead. And uh, it touches on a lot of sort of political and social issues that we're dealing with today, but it's also action packed. And I did stunts and action sequences and it looks phenomenal, shot by Jordan Oram. And um, yeah, so that will be coming out next year. And then right now I'm going into pre-production on my first film of my own in five years, which is a short film um, called Motherland. And it's about my father's experience meeting my mom's family in, in the US um, during the height of the 1979 Iranian hostage crisis. So it's, um, I'll, be, I'll be shooting that at the end of next month or early November. Well, we're so happy that you could take this time. I think Robin Hood sounds amazing. Can you uh, let us know what platform it will be on? Is it global or? It's global. Yeah, it'll be on global. Okay, great. So people can, can check it out there. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you for spending this time with us. We wish you the best of luck in all your future endeavors. No doubt it'll be incredible just looking at your career the past 24 hours. I've really done a deep dive and it's really <laughs> been a joy to see what your what you're up to and uh, really can't wait to see what, what you do next. Thank you so much.